Hi, my name is Alan Weil. I'm editor in chief of Health Affairs. We're very pleased to be releasing the April 2015 issue of the journal on the cost and quality of cancer care. We appreciate your participation in our release of this issue. Uh, there are two facts about cancer that are incontrovertible. The first is that quality as measured by outcomes is, uh, quality of care as measured by outcomes is certainly improving. There's uh, great evidence for that uh, published in many locations. Uh, the other fact is that spending on cancer care is increasing. Uh, we publish a lot on that topic as well. Um, if you're a beneficiary of the improvements in outcomes, uh, this is clearly a good. If you're paying for the care, whether directly or through premiums or other sources, uh, it's of some concern. The question is, how do we understand the balance between the cost and quality of cancer care? Uh, these are complex issues. Uh, they're medically complex. They're also complex from a policy perspective. It may be the case that overall, uh, outcomes are improving, but there's significant variability, and that variability makes understanding value more complex. Similarly, our spending is increasing, but not evenly. It, uh, it, we don't spend evenly, and the increases aren't even across different uh, geographic areas as well as different elements of cancer treatment. And so a comprehensive picture of the value that we receive for the dollars we uh, spend on cancer care is multi-layered. And this month's issue is designed to help policymakers and those in the healthcare community understand some of the dimensions of that complexity. Uh, it's that complexity also that makes publishing the journal uh, fun and exciting because it's a dynamic and complex topic. There's no one answer to the question of value, but there are many perspectives in our goal with the journal and with the event today is to provide you with some of those perspectives. Before we move into the content, uh, there are two things I want to do. The first is I would be remiss if I didn't note that despite the fact that there are a good number of papers in this issue on cancer, there are also quite a few other papers that I hope you will look at, uh, some having to do with primary care, some having to do with hospital care, and so there's more in the issue uh, than just the focus on cancer. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the financial support from Precision Health Economics and Celgene that made the issue possible as well as this event, and uh, we really can't do these theme uh, uh, issues without that kind of support. Uh, our event today will begin with a discussion, and uh, we will then move into presentations of the, of the individual papers. I'm going to kick off a discussion here with Ann Geiger, Acting Associate Director of the New Healthcare Delivery Research Program at the National Cancer Institute's Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, Ann Geiger has uh, spent time as well at Wake Forest University and at Kaiser Permanente Southern California. Uh, the author of our Narrative Matters piece this month is Pierre Elias, a medical student at the Duke University School of Medicine. He spent the last two years as a visiting researcher for hospital medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and as a TED Med research scholar. So I'm going to move over here and begin the first session, and then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. This is more comfortable. Uh, so I'm going to start, Anne, with you. Uh, you're at NCI, but as you told me, uh, this is, uh, you haven't been there that long, and you bring perspectives of, from academia as well as a de de care delivery system. Uh, you're looking out at the uh, horizon of cancer care and cancer research, particularly from the perspective of your uh, current position. Uh, give us some of your observations. Thank you. It's great to be here and talk with all of you today. I really enjoyed the, the articles in the journal. I highly recommend them. Um, when I looked at them, we, we at NCI are trying to expand our efforts in this area. And so when I looked at the articles, I thought about what kinds of things we've been talking about at NCI. And there were really three things that stood out for me. One is what an exciting time it is in cancer care. Um, we're really beginning to realize the benefits of all the basic science that has been done all these many years. And it looks like we're going to start really making some differences in treatment. For better or worse, those investments have not been 
the same in healthcare delivery research. And so we are now interested in catching up because the, the question is, it's wonderful to have all of these things, but if they don't get into community practice, well, then they're not reaching the people they were designed for. And so this is a very timely issue because I think we have to understand as the sample sizes, as the number of people for a given treatment gets smaller and the price goes up, what, what are we going to do about that as a society? So that's one of the kinds of questions that we're interested in. How do we make sure this, these things get out to everybody and, and what's gonna happen with the cost and the quality? The second thing that I was struck by is that I think we tend to think of policymakers as federal officials and maybe state officials. And I think you know, some of these articles talk about the societal perspective. Well, the societal perspective is difficult in this country because we don't have a unified healthcare system. And so I think we need to expand our thinking a little bit about who the policymakers are. And we need to expand our research to inform them. So a couple of examples. Many state legislatures right now are mandating breast density reporting after a mammogram. So they're making policy. And they're making policy that affects many, many people. And that's important. I think insurance companies and payers make policy much more than than people recognize. They actually, many of them, want evidence from research to do that. Um, so just, I think, keeping in mind as we look at some of these analyses, who, who's going to use them, and what does cost and quality mean to them? So the third thing, of course, is always patience. We always want to get back to patience. And cost and quality can be very difficult with patients and, and with their families. And so patients, when you say, uh, gee, cancer, cancer care is getting kind of expensive and it's unsustainable as a society, what people start to hear is, oh, I'm not going to get the care I need. You're, you're going to ration care and I'm not going to get what, what I need. And so the question I often pose to people, if that's not true, well, actually, maybe it is true because the co-payments are so high and because insurance rates are so high. And so I think we have to grapple with how we're going to balance that. How are we going to get expensive care to everyone and not just to the people who can afford it? And how do we help people understand some of the cost dynamics and that it's not influencing their care directly, um, hopefully? I think the second thing is quality for patients. Um, I think, in general, people tend to think more care is better care. And so we've promoted screening. And screening is great, except we're beginning to understand that screening has some harms. And I think it's very difficult for the public to understand what we are now calling harms, and that they are, in fact, important harms that need to be balanced with the benefits. I think people tend to think, well, my, my friend Joe got this treatment. Why I'm, am I not getting that treatment or that test? With precision medicine, that's going to be something we have to explain to people, that their treatment is very much tailored to them. And, and what your friend got is no longer a, a quality measure for you. Um, and I just think decision making is just going to be in incredibly important, helping people understand this complex information they're going to be dealing with. And Pierre's going to talk a little bit about families. I think families have such a huge influence on, on what patients do that we're also going to need to work more with families than we do. So that's a couple, couple of thoughts I had. Great. So let me, uh, let me start with a, a really simple question, okay. because that was such a simple uh, response to my question. Um, you know, we had the war on cancer. You're at the National Cancer Institute. But a lot of what the clinical uh, advances tell us is that cancer isn't an it. It's a multifaceted, and that's part of the complexity of the uh, advances in care, but it's also a complexity in communicating with families about treatment options. You said, my, my neighbor, my friend had this. Well, this may not be appropriate for you, even though you have the same kind of cancer. So are, is part of our challenge here, uh, are we stuck in a way of thinking about this whole constellation in the wrong way? And do we need a fundamental rethink of, of how we characterize uh, cancer? So one of the things I've observed in my career that pediatric oncologists think of cancer in children, and they think across children. In adult oncology, we think of organs. We think of breasts. We think of colons. 
And I have always been concerned about that because I think it's possible they might have more in common than we realize and the drugs might work differently. And so I think at NCI and in some of the research we see, people are starting to think about the genetic issues that underlie, underlie these cancers and are starting to realize, in fact, it may not be an organ. It may be the type of genetic problem that you have underlying it. And so I think we do need to, to change the way we conceptualize that. Um, and just to speak to your point, the, the war on cancer, I don't know if people have seen The Emperor of All Maladies or, or read the book, but the first um, episode is war, 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 fight, fight, fight. Um, I think one of the things that we think may be happening is that cancer is going to become a chronic disease. It's conceivable it's not going to be something that gets cured per se. We, we already see that with some diseases. It may be something that you take medicine for for a very long time, like hypertension. And so I think helping people adjust to that notion, um, we still have a ways to go. Um, you talked uh, in your uh, answer to my first question about a variety of audiences for, for the work um, and, and embraced a broad definition of policymaker. Um, can you go a little further with that? I mean, what, what, what do you see from where you sit now in how to improve the information that those different policymakers have so that they make better decisions? Well, I think the first thing may be simple and obvious, but it's to ask them what, what they need. I think in research, we tend to be very interested in cool ideas that we have, and I think it's incumbent upon us to understand what people need. And then once, once we do that, understand what kind of information they need, I think, I'm gonna use cost effectiveness analyses as an example. So one of the number one leading reasons for lawsuits is failure to detect breast cancer. And lawsuits can be very costly if you're running a healthcare plan like a Kaiser Permanente or a group health. They can be the top one or two or three reasons you get sued. Well, we don't take that into account when we do cost effectiveness analyses. And so looking at things like that that are atypical that we've not traditionally thought about, I think is one thing we need to do. I also think in terms of quality, some of, if you think about an elected official, quality for them is getting reelected. So they, you know, apologies to all elected officials, they may actually not be very interested in evidence. Their evidence may be people think this should happen. Um, again, going back to health insurers, bad publicity is a quality. If we stay off the front page of the Washington Post, then we're doing pretty well. And so I think being a little more creative about the questions we ask in research and, and hearing from, from people what kinds of things they're, they're really, and we're starting to see some of these conversations. Well, speaking of listening to people and trying to figure out uh, what their needs are, let's bring uh, Pierre Elias into the conversation. We were really pleased to publish your Narrative Matters piece, and uh, maybe since the issue is so fresh, I suspect people in the room haven't had a chance to read it. Why don't you tell us what your experience was? Thank you so much for having me here and uh, giving the opportunity to, to speak with all of you. And thank you all for being here this early in the morning and looking so great. Um, so um, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a medical student. I've taken a bit of a, a wandering path. So I was uh, at Duke for medical school and I've done research at the University of California, San Francisco with uh, Bob Wachter for the last two years. And um, uh, when I was uh, in my clinical year in medical school, uh, it was kind of near the end of the year, and to kind of give you a sense, so um, for the last 13 months, uh, I've been you know, working about six to six and a half days a week. Uh, I'm really just now getting introduced into the the culture of medicine, right? You know, before this, you're, you're studying, you're, you're reading the books, but how does the hospital work? How does the hospital feel? How do, we, uh, how do we actually interact with patients? That's all still kind of fresh. And uh, I, was, I was on my internal medicine rotation, and I was on the general medicine wards. And at this point, um, you start to take more ownership of your patients. There are patients that you feel like the primary provider, and then you pass things on to your resident and say, I think we should do this, and the, the attending okays it. But um, you're the person spending a lot of time 
with the patient. And uh, this one particular patient, Steve, and his wife, Laura, and they were just the most fantastic couple. When you have this notion in your head of like a, uh, a wonderful, charming, older Southern couple, they were that. And just really sweet and kind. They had a funny story for everything. Um, they just made you feel at home. And uh, Steve was you know, uh, uh, a very vigorous guy. I mean, he was in his 70s, still fixing air conditioners. But um, he, he came in because he had low counts of all of his blood cell lines. So uh, the next thing we know, we're working him up for cancer. And I'm seeing him one morning. And he's not feeling right. He's, his head's kind of cloudy. And before we realize it, he's had a massive stroke. And it was, it was a stroke actually caused by uh, the cancer. Uh, sometimes certain cancers can um, cause what we call uh, DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagul coagulopathies. And, and, and you end up getting this uh, clotting and then bleeding into your brain. Um, that day, we uh, had to transition his care to two different ICUs. First, the, the ICU that was closest just to stabilize him, and then the neuro ICU. And throughout this whole process, we were so busy trying to get Steve into the right hands, um, we didn't have time for Laura. And uh, near the end of the day, you know, my team is catching up on the other 14, 15 patients they have to see um, and trying to provide them appropriate care. Uh, I go down to the ICU where the new team is taking care of him. And um, I start talking with the residents there, and um, they barely know who Steve is. They just know what happened to him today. They have no idea that he has a wife, let alone that she's sitting in an ICU waiting room about 100 feet away. Um, and when I asked them when we're going to go talk with Laura, um, you know, the, the response was, was pretty simple. You know, the oncologist can talk with her in the morning. Uh, right now, we, uh, we have patients who aren't stable, and he is. And uh, what had happened is, is that same day, the bone marrow biopsy came back and showed that he had a very rare form of, of cancer called acute promyelocyte leukemia. And so at around 9 PM, as a second year medical student, not knowing anything or really how to effectively handle the situation, I felt so badly that I had to do something that I went to this IC waiting room and I sat down with Laura and her 12 family members. And I asked her what she knew about that day. And it was clear that she knew something bad had gone on, but she had no details. No one really had much time to speak with her. And I said, Laura, Steve has cancer. And um, no one should have to hear that from a medical student. I'm not trained in that. I have very little training or time to, to deliver bad news. And uh, I put us in an awkward territory where I was trying to balance um, how much I knew about the diagnosis and answering those tough questions everyone wants to answer. Right? Is he going to be OK? You know, what are his chances? Is the stroke going to leave him in a wheelchair? Things that I'm not qualified to answer. And um, through this entire process, Laura and her family, they were incredibly kind to me. They really just wanted um, someone to, to, to hold their hand, to tell them what was going on, and, uh, and, and to pray with them. And um, I think it didn't really matter to them all that much who it was. It was, it was getting that information in a timely manner and, and, and feeling supported. And uh, when I was working with, with Bob, my mentor, uh, Bob is well known in, uh, in the patient safety world, we really said, well, how did this happen? And um, what it came down to was um, everyone is busy. When we have um, situations where there is acute decompensation of a patient, when a patient gets sick unexpectedly in the hospital and we have to transfer their teams, we don't have very effective systems put in place. Um, so when a patient comes into the hospital and we're assessing them for the first time, we have a specific note for that. It's called the H&P, the history and physical. When we're seeing a patient uh, the next day, we have a note for that. It's called the SOAP note, Subjective Objective Assessment Plan. We have these standardized structures that doctors communicate with one another using. In, in, in transfers, this is still new. And really, in the last five to 10 years only have we started to build things like the, um, the sign-out mnemonic or the I-PASS mnemonic. And while that has, to some extent, improved uh, the quality of communication between doctors when we're transferring patients, um, there's really two big problems. One, they're not effectively instituted. Um, many places still don't use uh, an effective way to transfer a patient like this. Um, 
And, and two, all of these uh, well-known uh, systems, whether it's uh, SignOut or iPass, which was published in New England Journal last year, um, none of them talk about the family. No one ever says, on my checklist of things to do, who is the key point person to communicating with the family? In this episode of decompensation, where something bad happened to this patient, who are we going to designate with the responsibility to communicate with the family? And we have so many different quality measures that we're continuing to look at. We have many sick people to take care of in the hospital. Um, but when we examine things in the larger scale, we see that these quality measures don't take into account communication with the family. It's something that is still missing. It's not effectively defined in the patient safety or errors literature. And it's a, it's a continued problem. So uh, one of the things we recognized is um, right up there with all the other things that we want to do in an effective transfer of care, we have to say, who is going to take charge and communicate with the family? Um, because at the end of the day, um, you know, leaving Laura in that ICU waiting room to wait until the morning to have someone tell her that her husband of 40 years, who she'd been by his bedside the entire time he'd been in the hospital, leaving her without knowing what had happened that day, that, that didn't seem right. And I'd, I'd like to see that changed. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that uh, uh, experience. Um, I do have to ask, you felt like you were out a, on a limb. I am curious what the response was uh, institutionally to that. Yeah, so I, I love Duke. And uh, that's, that's where I, I go to medical school. And uh, you know, um, other than being national basketball champions, there's other wonderful <laughs> things about Duke. Um, all of the physicians I worked with that day, that week, that month, um, they are incredible physicians. They are the sort of physician that you want. They are kind. They are caring. They follow up on things. But what happens is you have a system where people are consistently overburdened, and there is um, a uh, lack of effective protocols to make it clear who the point person is in these, in these trying times. Um, I would say that my biggest realization from it was um, that after I pushed a little bit, I was scared. I was, I was scared to push more. Um, and I think that says something um, more about hospital culture and how when we're in this hierarchy, you can, you can push a little bit, but you have to listen to your elders. You have to listen to what the people above you are saying. And that comes before those internal feelings you might have. That being said, um, communicating with people at Duke, they've been phenomenal. They've been very understanding. Um, and uh, they, they recognize this is a, a challenge across the country. Uh, working at UCSF, they have um, very similar problems. Um, one of the things that uh, I admire is when an institution is able to, to recognize these challenges and, and improve it. And that's, that's exactly what I'm seeing at, at my home institution. So Anne, uh, let's uh, bring this back now into your world. Uh, you mentioned at the outset the importance of taking uh, research and moving it out. Uh, but if we're asking the wrong questions, or I should say if we're leaving important questions out, uh, then spreading out may address some concerns, but leave others behind. So how do you take a story like this and do something uh, positive with it, not at the institution level that Pierre describes, but uh, at a higher system level? So I, I don't think Pierre has had time yet to learn that outpatient cancer care has some of these same characteristics. Your primary care provider sends you to get screened. You have a positive screening test. Who tells you about that? What do they say to you? When do they tell you? Do they leave you a voicemail? Getting a voicemail that says, we need to talk to you about your screening test is akin to being told you something is wrong. And then I, you, know, you get sent to the surgeon. You get sent to the medical oncologist. It may be we're going to have other types of providers that come into play. And so one of the things that we're definitely very interested in, and I think there's a growing amount of work, is the same thing. How do you manage these pass-offs in outpatient care, and, and who is responsible? Pierre mentioned he's interested in health information technology. It's very hard to pass people off when one place has one system, another place has a different system, they don't share results. 
Um, it's very complicated. So the, the sorts of things that we are trying to promote, I, in our world, we've done a lot of patient level. We, we've asked patients to learn, try to learn to keep track of all of this and to assemble all your results in one place so that you can take them to your physician. We've, we've put a lot on the patient in a, in a difficult time where they're, they've found out they've got cancer and they're now trying to be treated. We're interested in putting some more burden back on the system. Um, it, it's hard to put more burden on the providers because they're being paid often in piecemeal work. And so they have to get through a lot of patients in a day to keep their practice afloat. But there are things that we could do around them that could help. We could build systems that make pass-offs. We could have standard procedures. Um, we, we could facilitate that. I think there are also ways that we can change reimbursement. And so um, CM, CMS has recently announced they're going to do a new oncology care model. And the nice thing about that model is it requires that there be a, somebody on call to talk to families and patients 24 hours a day. So if you need something at 9 o'clock at night, there will be someone to call who should have access to information and can help you. It requires more careful planning. It, it helps the patients navigate through the system. And what's interesting about that model is it's a per person per month payment. So they're saying, we're not going to pay you for your consultation today. We're going to pay you to take care of this person and their family for this month. And so in research, that's a natural experiment for us. And CMS is going to be looking at that and evaluating that. But there are other things. There are things that Duke could do to facilitate, for example, bringing people in from the community for consultations, getting people involved in trials. So there's, where we are is really trying to move away from the patient and more into what systems can do about this, about some of these challenges. Um, I was struck, Pierre, at the, the role of medical education. Also, you said. Uh, that you, you hadn't really been exposed to these topics. Uh, a few years have gone by. Does it just come later in the curriculum, or is it absent? So it's um, one of the things I've, I've realized in medical school is it turns out there's a lot of information to learn about being a doctor. Um, this is quite a bit. And um, at, so Duke has a, a uh, non-traditional curriculum where actually your, your preclinical, which is normally two years, is actually 11 months. So it's, it's, it's quite busy. Um, we, we learn how to talk with patients. So one of the things that's become much more common is using standardized patients. In fact, at Duke, um, three hours of every week um, throughout the, um, the majority of your, your time in medical school is spent um, in something called practice course, which literally teaches you how do we communicate effectively with patients? How do we deal with these sorts of things? But there's a, there's a, a level of understanding of, of uh, what should a medical student be doing and learning, and, and what should um, residents and, and attendings be, be doing? And, and so uh, part of it is I think you really need to um, see many patients and, and, and see the, uh, the pathway of, of disease over and over again to, um, to recognize uh, what they're going through and to help them navigate it. And, and that's where the role of, uh, of, of true clinical experience, I think, is most valuable. When, when we think of our doctors and what we want, we want someone who has experience holding our hands, uh, telling us, I've, I've been here before, and I can help you through it. And uh, I think that's, that's the value of having someone with a great deal of experience uh, utter those words for you. Um, the, the one thing I, I would add to what um, Anne was saying is, um, it, it is this idea of um, establishing patterns and making it easier for, for physicians. So at, at Duke, there's actually a very innovative uh, care model. Um, all, uh, all cancer wards, so uh, patients specific to the cancer units, they actually get two physicians instead of one. Um, one is a palliative care attending, and the other one is uh, an oncologist. And it's about this idea of having two physicians understanding the, the whole area of care. And I, I saw an intern the other day get chewed out because he forgot to email the outpatient oncologist that his patient had been admitted. 
And it's something that is so important to the culture that the person who has seen this patient for the longest time is aware of what's going on. But the problem is when you're seeing 15 or 20 patients a day, these sorts of things can slip through the cracks. So what can we do to institute systems on uh, institution and national level that make this much easier to do rather than it being one of 100 different things on your daily checklist as a physician? And I think, so, if you don't mind, I, I think this is where quality gets very difficult. I, I would posit to everyone that quality is driven by what we can measure rather than what we should measure. And so it's very difficult to make having clear communication with the family a quality measure because it's really difficult to measure that. And so I think in this era of big data and the era of electronic medical records, we may need to think about incorporating some of those things and p making that part of the reimbursement system because I think until you can measure it, it's very hard to make it a standard part of care. You can measure whether you took the person's temperature. You, it's much harder to measure did you speak with the family in the waiting room. And so I think that's a challenge. And I think we see that in the journal today. Uh, people are doing very good things with the data they have, but it is the data we have. Yeah, so I was struck uh, as a non-clinician that in, in both of what you said, there was a lot of reference to what I think of as systems in a micro sense, handoffs, transfers, mm -hmm. protocols, information, interoperability, who has mm -hmm. the information. And it's great to build out and add a step that says, oh, add this, add that, and then you've got a protocol and you measure whether or not people are following it. Um, but it does seem to me that the failure that Pierre wrote about is it may have occurred in the context of a transfer, but it's really a systemic failure about failure to engage the family of the patient. And if we fix the problem of engaging with the family in a transfer, we're not going to fix it in, and it's why you brought out these issues occur in outpatient medicine as well. So what I wonder is, and maybe this gets back to, to the comment Anne you just made as I was listening uh, to what you all said earlier, is there a way to really flip the focus to quality as people mean it, which in the example here was family engagement, but that's certainly not the only mm -hmm. uh, uh, patient-oriented uh, measure we might have of quality that's not just a clinical outcome. Is there a way to think very differently about that as opposed to as a distinct issue from fixing these processes which seem to be missing some elements? Yeah. Well, I think Pierre used a, a word that was very important that I heard, which is culture. Uh, what we're ultimately really talking about is a change in the culture of how we deliver medical care, how we practice medicine and, and deliver care. Um, there's been so much emphasis on doing procedures and getting people drugs. And you know, the, the quality chasm report from the Institute of Medicine came out in 1999, and we still don't have patient-centered care. We still don't have, we're, we're, we're not meeting. We've made tremendous progress in patient safety, but there's still a lot to do. And I think, unfortunately, in the end, if you want to change the whole big system, you're looking at a new generation of people coming along, uh, people like Pierre, who are coming along in a different time and saying, perhaps we need to be thinking about this as an important part of care. And I think our work, we're increasingly understanding that outcomes are improved when you take care of people and their families. So what I'll add to that, I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that, that's being said here. Um, I've thought a lot about why would Yelp for doctors not work? And, and I don't think it would, and, and there's a reason for that. So the reason Yelp works when you go to a restaurant is you are simply rating a subjective experience. How much did you enjoy that experience? And, and you have complete control over that. When we talk about quality in medicine, I think there are two disparate groups. There is the quality of care that you receive in relation to how much is it going to improve your health or how much is it dealing with your disease process, right? Mortality and morbidity. But there is another notion of quality, 
which is how did I feel about this experience, right? So there's kind of both these subjective and objective notions. And they are not quite as tied as we may think, right? The doctor who avoids the difficult conversation with you may be giving you worse quality care from an objective time, but they may have a nice, pleasant conversation with you so you feel good about them from a subjective sense. What I think is happening, and I'm very young and very novice to this, um, and I admit my ignorance, is we focus a lot on the objective side because we do need to make that better. Um, on the subjective side, that is where I actually have immense faith in my profession and those people who are in the health services. If they have the opportunity to simply close the door and be there with the patient and not be distracted by anything else for 15 minutes, I have an immense amount of faith that health professionals would be able to provide the kindness and patience um, and, and the support that patients need. The challenge is when we talk about quality in these two different ways and they're competing with one another. When I'm sitting at my computer typing out a note and filling out a thousand checkboxes, when there is also this other notion of quality, the subjective experience of support. And those two, they, they, they're sometimes at odds. And that's what I continue to see. And I'll, I'll just say that Building on that, I think when we think about that subjective piece, we have had a tendency to look at satisfaction, which is the Yelp. Did you have a nice dinner or not? Did you have a nice time at the doctor? We don't tend to ask people, did you feel like the doctor, doctor paid attention to you? Do you feel like you had an opportunity to make a thoughtful decision? And so that's another area where NCI and, and other people can fund that sort of work and, and dovetail it with some of the shared decision-making work. And so I, I think that's a good point. So that was actually the last, I was gonna uh, ask one last question of you and then we have a minute or two if folks uh, in the uh, room would like to, but you're, you have, you're in uh, this new, new program, right? Healthcare Delivery Research Program, and it's within NCI. But clearly these systems issues cut across uh, uh, conditions, cut across uh, the research needs. Um, so just give us a, a moment about what that uh, new uh, program is about and how you see it as a tool mm -hmm. for achieving what we've mm -hmm. just been discussing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're just figuring out who we are. Um, but we are interested in, as is all of NCI, having the best outcomes possible. And as I've been talking about, we're interested in these many levels, patients, providers, and systems. And so we have actually three groups that, in essence, become our, our primary focus areas. And one group is doing a lot of the kinds of work we see here today, which is um, trying to figure out what's going on with electronic data and trying to figure out what kinds of data we need. And, um, trying to monitor access and trying to figure out what you might call the objective parts of this, what, what, what you can measure in data. Um, we have another group that is looking at outcomes in a more patient-centered way, a more person-centered way. And so they're trying to understand the, the things we've been talking about. And then we have another group that is, I think, the biggest area of expansion for us, and that's an intervention group. And so in health services research, it's much easier to study things in an observational study sense, to see what's going on. We have to take it to the next level and start intervening and start testing and start holding some of our efforts to the same standards that we would hold drugs or an imaging procedure or something. So um, I don't know if that's at all helpful, but um, you know, we're really, and, and you asked about other, other diseases. Um, NCI has a huge budget. Um, we, we are fortunate to have a bypass budget that goes directly to the president. Um, not that that matters very much right now. Um, but, you know, I think we're going to end up being leaders. And I think many of the people who work in health services and some of the people that we're going to see here in a few minutes actually work across many areas. So they may start in it with a cancer problem, but, but a lot of what we do there will apply to, to other things. And we, we also work with primary care. There's a tremendous potential for 
work in cancer to become the theoretical foundation for work in, in other diseases. And we certainly make an effort to keep up with what's going on around us. So, uh, We probably can fit one question in here. So if we can get a microphone to you and, uh, I don't oh. Think I need uh, well, we prefer to have one uh, if we can get it to you. So, uh, is it on? Oh, so uh, I'm Marion Grant. I'm a assistant professor at the School of Nursing at the University of Maryland, and I would like to remind everyone that there is a whole cadre of other disciplines in the hospital. And even though the physicians might not have known that there was a family in their waiting room, usually the ICU nurse knows that, having been an ER nurse and an ICU nurse and now as a palliative care nurse practitioner. And I would say that as we look to the future, to trying to build better systems, we have to recognize that certain disciplines have inherent advantages or strengths, and we should leverage that. I don't know that we'll ever be able to make all physicians um, more holistic in their approach or all have wonderful bedside manner. And I know patients who don't even want that if they get a great doctor. But we could supplement that with social workers and nurses and chaplains and a, an array of, of other disciplines. And so I, I hope that in the health service research, we're also looking at the system from a multi-interprofessional manner. A absolutely. And that goes back in many ways to the reimbursement problem. If, if what you're getting reimbursed for is the doctor talking to the patient and laying hands on the patient, that doesn't cover some of the things you just mentioned. And so the, the new CMS model likely will start bringing more of those kinds of people into the care. And hopefully physicians, I think, are at a place where they actually do understand many of them the need for these things and I think are interested in helping their patients get those things. It's just making a system that allows those people to be there and, and covers their costs. Uh, in a cancer center, many of these things, unfortunately, are paid for by private grants, um, donations. And that's no way to run a cancer center based on um, what the local people are interested in giving money for. Great. Uh, well, thanks to you both uh, for sharing uh, two very different uh, perspectives, but bringing them together and kicking off the discussion. Uh, we do not have a break, but we do need to uh, get ready for our, our next speaker. So I'm going to stand up, let these folks uh, uh, step down and uh, don't go anywhere. Our, our first set of uh, presentations uh, has to do with uh, valuing innovation in cancer care. We're going to hear from Thomas Philipson, Daniel Levin, Professor of Public Policy Studies at the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, an associate member of the Department of Economics and former senior lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School. And we will hear from Warren Stevens, a senior economist at Precision Health Economics, where he has undertaken international comparisons of cancer programs, designed health policy decision models, developed global value of health models, and novel, developed novel approaches to estimating unmet need across disease areas and populations. Uh, these are, uh, all of these presentations will uh, tie back to papers in the issue. And I'll turn it over first to Thomas. Okay, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about some work we've done. We've done a lot of work, uh, both academically and through precision health economics, on essentially assessing the value of uh, cancer care. And this is uh, uh, this paper is uh, is a, is a paper in a series of string of research that we're actually undertaking. Some of that is. Uh, uh, is discussed, I, I discuss quite frequently on the Forbes op-ed page, which I have every month, and you might go there on, under my name to see what other work we've been doing. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the, in the press, obviously, of the new innovative oncology treatments, and uh, you see a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, reactions to new treatments that are coming out. And, and hence, uh, we sort of are here uh, at a 
sort of crossroad, I think, the last few years where there's been enormously effective treatments coming out, not only in oncology, but hepatitis C and other areas. Uh, but uh, because they're enormously successful, they're also very valuable and, and can command high prices. And that has led to a pretty substantial uh, debate. Uh, <coughs> what's missing in the debate many times is sort of a comparison of how beneficial new treatments are relative to their new cost. And when we started the session today, we hear about health outcomes being important, and yes, things have improved. We also hear about spending going up, and yes, spending is going up. The question is really, what's the relative magnitude of those two, and does it make sense on the, on the path we are? So in laying out the, uh, the way uh, I think about this, and, uh, and I think most uh, economists would think about this, uh, I want to distinguish some terms. One is the price of health care, which you want to distinguish from the price of health. So my favorite example is HIV treatments, heart that came out in 1996, dramatically improved longevity of HIV positive individuals. Before heart came out, buying a life was not feasible. You couldn't buy a longer life. There was nowhere to go to buy a longer life. In essence, what that is telling you that the price of a longer life in 1995 was infinite. You couldn't buy it anywhere. When a heart came out, regardless of the price, it lowered the price of buying a life because it was infinite before. And even if heart cost a million bucks a patient, which it didn't, it would have lowered the price of a longer life. So irregardless, if a new innovation comes out, irregardless of its price, it's going to increase, it's going to decrease the marginal price of health. What do I mean by marginal versus average? And I'm going to talk <laughs> quite a bit about that here. <laughs> so for the youngest student in, in the audience, that's an easy concept because a GPA, grade point average, is an average. And the only way you increase a GPA is to get a better grade than your GPA, which is a marginal grade, the new additional grade added to the average. And we'll talk about the similar similar concept in healthcare with the price per quality of care uh, or price per quality is essentially an average and do you increase or decrease that with new innovations which is a marginal effect on your health. But the first thing I want to make clear is essentially <coughs> that regardless of the price of any new innovation it lowers the price of health. So the increased value, why is it an increased value? Because you can always not use the innovation and be back to where you bef were before. You can't be worse off with the new innovation because you can always not use it. So the discussion whether new innovations add value or not is misleading because al it always does in this sense I've, I told you about. <coughs> now, in, in uh, HIV, that's a, a particular case. We're going to talk about oncology today because oncology, it, there's been sort of a debate whether it increases the average uh, health that you purchase. And the buzzword for that is price per quality. We measure some kind of quality just in life years from therapies. And then we ask how, how much of an uh, increase on that do we have or decrease. Price per quality is the equivalent to price per square foot in real estate. You can get a bigger house, that is to say, more effective medical treatment. But <laughs> does the price go up more when you get the bigger house than the, than the size of the house, and that determines the price per square foot, which is the price per quality we're talking about in healthcare. So if you understand what is price per square foot in real estate, you understand price per quality in, in, in healthcare. So what has happened with price per quality for cancer care? We looked at col colorectal cancer, and where the, the prices are, or the spending has obviously gone up dramatically, ex exponentially. But if you adjust that for the, for the quality that you're buying, it has, not much has happened. So this price is going up. You're, bigger, you're buying bigger houses if you want, but the price per square foot of housing has remained the constant in, in, this, in the col uh, colorectal cancer case. If you look at <coughs> multiple myeloma, it's the same pattern. Costs have increased dramatically over time. But if you look at the price per health, it actually has gone down over time. So these houses have become bigger, uh, but the price per square foot of the house has gone down. Uh, you're buying more health for the buck in, in, in this type of cancer care. 
So it's important both to distinguish two concepts. One is the marginal price of health. What's the price of additional health before the innovation, usually infinite. And the innovation always lowers that price. These prices has to do with the average price of health. And even the average price many times falls with innovation. It's not always true. There's been a big debate uh, in the literature whether this, this is true. I have some papers here that have shown conflicting results on this. But regardless of what happens to these average prices of health when innovation com comes in, and they always lower marginal prices. And that's really the key issue, because sooner or later, these things go into generic. And they, 10 years later, the marginal prices dro drop dramatically for, for the entire population. So, debate, so the debate on cancer care, I think, is very misguided in some sense. We have a lot of discussion on costs. We don't have the discussion how they relate to the benefits. We have discussions that benefits might be going up. But the relationship between the two are not necessarily discussed quantitatively. And if you do that, many times it looks like uh, certainly we're getting lower marginal costs for, for health, but we're also getting high, uh, lower uh, average costs for health as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, right this way, that way? There you go. Uh -huh. I apologize in advance for my confusing accent. Um, I promise not to use words like trousers or dustbin during the presentation. <laughs> um, comparisons of different health systems around the world are fraught with difficulties. Uh, the populations in which those health systems cover are heterogeneous. Their risks vary, their age varies, the sex mix up varies. And so, you know, the, comparing like with like is, is, is often a complex thing. Additionally, the health systems themselves often have different priorities. Some may value, some prioritize value, some may prioritize choice, some access, for example. So comparing like with like is obviously a, a difficult thing. Nevertheless, there have been a lot of studies recently comparing cancer care across different uh, countries and across different systems. And there has been a lot of interest in the outcomes of these studies. What we are trying to do in, with our study was to look at comparing outcomes across different countries, but also comparing costs. That hadn't been done quite so much. Most of the studies did look primarily at outcomes. But when comparing country level studies across different countries, as I say, there are differences across the board in terms of background risk, in terms of demographics. So we needed to have a, an outcome measure that allowed us to measure like for like, uh, compare apples to apples. Fortunately, this array of different studies looking at the international comparison of uh, cancer outcomes in countries had developed and refined these measures. And one of the ones we used for our study was something called excess cancer mortality, which is basically cancer mortality adjusted for the age in the country, specific to the country, and adjusted for the background mortality, the cause of death from other diseases. So that's what we used to do our study. Then in terms of cancer spend, we actually pulled together as many as we could in terms of high income countries. Um, we had more to begin with in the sort of low 20s, but one of the inclusion criteria was to have age and sex specific mortality data, incidence data and cost data based on cancer care, all of which wasn't available for all the years in all the countries that, that we would have liked. So we ended up with about 16 countries and we categorized those into low spend, medium spend and high spend on cancer care. They're all high income countries. One thing we, for the first thing we found was the level of spend was, was actually quite strongly correlated with the outcomes, with the excess cancer mortality. As you can see, the low cancer, uh, sorry, the low, low cancer, the low spending countries, uh, their excess cancer mortality rate fell from about 210 down to just about 190. Similarly, the medium spending countries, also similar rate of fall, but at a lower level. And then finally, the high spending countries, similar rate of fall, but at, at an ex exponentially smaller level. The interesting thing with this finding that we weren't necessarily expecting was that there was little convergence over time. Usually the diffusion of these expensive innovations that we've all been talking about uh, down towards the lower spending countries over time as these, these technologies become more affordable or easier to access or the effectiveness of these interventions becomes more apparent. This diffusion tends to lead to this sort of convergence, but we didn't see that with our, with our grouping. So we thought we'd look, a little bit, uh, a little bit, look at a little bit more detail. We tend to see values, as Thomas has just mentioned, in a very static sense. We pay out this money and we get these goods in return. So we 
spend this much on cancer care and we get a chunk of, of cancer outcomes or cancer benefit or treatment benefit back in return. But in truth, when you're looking at individual interventions, that's a sensible way to look at it. But when you're looking at the, the effectiveness of a health system, a key role of a health system is its ability to translate this conveyor belt of new innovations and technologies into an effective impact on health gain in countries. The speed of this change, the rate of this progress, has huge value for people being diagnosed today and tomorrow. We actually also hypothesize the rate at which this progress, progress takes place would fall, would diminish over time, in the same way that, and this is quite a common uh, concept in, in economics, the dismal science, and I won't go into the technical details, but generally, a bit like when you're, you're developing, uh, uh, trying to get vaccination coverage rates up, it's much harder to get from 95% to 100% than from maybe 55% to 60%, because you're getting nearer to your ultimate goal. So you've taken all the low-hanging fruit and you're stretching to try and get the, far, the last few apples on the top of the tree. So that's a fairly normal concept. And our analysis of global cancer mortality rates over time show that this actually this, this effect was in place. What we were interested in is, is this effect, does, does this effect take place in terms of cancer spend? Or are we seeing this diminishing return as our, our spend increases? And we plot, so what we did is we plotted spend per case and excess mortality rate against each other for all the countries we had uh, in our data set. And sure enough, the best fitted model did tend to suggest that there was a slight diminishing rate of returns over time, uh, or diminishing rate of, of, of progress of benefit over time for these countries. Perhaps just as interesting, we then looked at uh, just the high spending countries, going back to this lack of conversion. We wanted to try and understand why there was this lack of conversion that we'd normally see from the diffusion of innovations. And one of the things we speculated was that, uh, in actual fact, the dividend from high spending countries uh, approving and utilizing these new technologies more often, more, more uh, earlier on in the process, is also a dividend. Is that outweighing the dividend of the diffusion of these technologies becoming affordable to lower spending countries? And it seems like it does, because as we saw, the best fitted trend for those high spending countries is that progress is happening at a faster rate, whereas in, under the, the, the sort of global, global fitted model, we'd expect it to be a little bit slower. So that was a very interesting um, finding. We can only, we don't know exactly what that is. As I say, we've speculated that it might be this dividend of, of having higher access to, uh, or greater access and earlier access to these new interventions, higher spending or higher costing initially interventions that eventually over time become much more, more valuable and, and then are diffused down to the other countries. So this dividend could be outweighing this diffusion dividend that, that we're more commonly associated with. Another example could be that, um, Higher spending countries and, and countries that accept more innovations and approve more innovations and new technologies earlier may have multiple innovations and multiple treatment protocols for different types of cancer. Whereas in other countries, I know in my home country, in the UK, for example, there are certain cancers where they will only approve the use of one particular drug. Now, where you have a very heterogeneous uh, population for a particular disease, it could be that having multiple different types of treatments uh, allows for a, a better overall gain for that more heterogeneous group of people. This is purely speculation. We don't know for sure what causes this relationship. So what do we learn from this study? Well, cancer outcomes depend on lots of different things, but using these outcome measures that try to weight away things like age and, and, and mortality rates from other diseases, we did show that countries that spend more on cancer care tend to have better outcomes, simple as that. There's little evidence of any convergence over time, which makes us think this is not purely due to the diffusion of older, acceptable uh, technologies. The speed of progress globally diminishes over time, and by spend, simple, sorry, the, the speed of progress diminishes over time, both in terms of spend and in terms of, you know, over time, as it were. Um, and, and as such, comparisons between countries, like-for-like like comparison between countries, are probably a little bit simplistic because countries at different positions on the mortality scale will inevitably have different profiles of spending. Um, and finally, uh, given this response, we, we, we've done this primarily just in cancer care. Uh, we're yet to know, and it might be interesting to find out, if this same effect is seen in other areas of therapeutic care. For this, we don't know, but perhaps potential research could look at that in the future. Okay, thank you. I hope I kept the time there. I got lots of red cards at the end. I'm going to start with a couple of questions before we open it up. Um, 
Thomas, you, you present a framework of, of thinking about uh, value that you think would uh, yield a more robust uh, discussion and understanding in the public. Um, I'm wondering about sort of the back end of that discussion, which is the role of pricing. Is the implication broadly of what you're saying that uh, when on the back end, as we're seeing the relationship between improvements in outcomes and the spend, that it would be appropriate to rethink the pricing of drugs at that point to uh, have more consistency in uh, the degree to which they're uh, improving value as opposed to just looking at their total price and say, wow, these prices seem high. Is that a reasonable implication of your work? <clears throat> yeah, I think, it's on, yeah, I think uh, that's exactly what we're trying to say here. So there's, there's obviously a reason why a market can command a higher price if there's other substitutes available. So when a particular drug comes out, there's no way that a plan or a person is going to buy that drug if it's more expensive than the alternative unless there's some additional value attached to that drug that isn't present in the alternative. So uh, the market and uh, plan benefit managers are not very stupid. They're very rational. They're very precise. They have a lot of evidence on how they pay for things, probably more rational than many other markets, to be honest. And we think of healthcare as being this confused place. But if you think at, about the buyers, it's not the patients. It's many times the plans that make the calls, really. The patient pay the extra co-pays. And in those calculations, many times, you can't go in as a seller and start, charge, start charging higher prices unless you got something, like any other market. Uh, so that naturally occurs in any kind of market pricing between manufacturers and sellers. If you can't differentiate your product, you, no one's going to want to pay a premium for it. The question is, how much of a premium are you, can you charge? And you know, uh, Savaldi, I think, is, a, is sort of the poster child now in hepatitis C. Savaldi is a misleading case because it's a big upfront charge for a very long, lifelong benefit. So usually when we say it's a misguided to talk about price per pill for Savaldi because you're getting a, a hepatitis C-free life for an initial expense. So the initial expense is high. But the benefit of that treatment is very long. The problem with Savali is that if Gilead has invented a pill that you took every year and it costs two or three thousand dollars a year, no one would lift an eyebrow. Even though Savali is less expensive in present value terms, it's the fact that it's so much spending up front that people react to. And usually when we have spending up front, I come back to real estate again. We have loan markets or credit markets, i.e. mortgages. No one here pays for their house up front with their own money. They borrow money and then they pay over time of during the lifelong benefit of living in the house while you're living. We don't have credit markets for medical technologies. And that's really the Savaldi problem. And that's going to be a big problem in immunotherapy and cancer, et cetera where we get these big prevalence diseases coming out with very valuable treatment. Uh, God forbid we come out with a cure for diabetes. Uh, that would be a, you know, a financial disaster according to the payers, uh, but obviously very, very beneficial for people with diabetes who are, in, who are, in, are at risk for diabetes. The, the question then would almost ultimately have to be, how do we finance upfront expenditures that have longer benefits? And we don't, currently don't have those credit mechanisms in healthcare. And that's why you get these confused value debates, because the value is not occurring upfront. It's occurring over a long lifetime, and it doesn't get counted. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Warren, I, this is an international comparison, but it's hard not to look at it from the US perspective. And maybe that's distorting. Uh, the question that I have of you. Um, much of the work is based on sort of trying to understand this lack of convergence. Um, but it seems to me that a big factor in the, the uh, slope of those lines is the price people are paying. And we've published a lot in health affairs, and there's a lot of discussion in this country, certainly, about irrational pricing. And so it, it feels hard to draw conclusions about innovation and spread of innovation when uh, such an important factor in the slope of those lines is what, how much are we paying for these things. So how do you take into consideration as you're doing these international comparisons, not that there's some sort of global market and this reflects the natural price of them, but that there are really different pricing schemes around the globe, so the reason for the slope of the line may be very different uh, depending on what the pricing scheme is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh 
Uh, it has a very good point. Uh, and, and in actual fact, higher spending countries do tend to spend slightly more on, on new innovations and new technologies because they're using them earlier when the prices tend to be earlier before the diffusion takes place. So in essence, the difference between those lines should really be a little bit bigger because those high spending countries are spending more at the margin for a lot of these innovations. So one of the reasons why you might see um, convergence when you do it by spend is that the price per each unit is a little bit higher. So that's why we were so surprised by the lack of conversions in those. So in a sense, it's saying that even those host high spending countries are spending more per unit of care. Um, what they're generating from it in terms of the dividend from that earlier execution and utilization of those technologies is over and above any other diffusion of innovation. Thank you. Uh, what questions do we have, uh, please? We've got two here in the middle. And then we'll get, yes, please wait for the microphone. And then we'll get these two in, John. Um, I find it uh, Please uh, say who you are. And, Hi, George Silverman. And, and, I, and I, I do want to get as many questions in as possible. So go uh, Cancer Policy Group, I find it a little astounding to hear the healthcare market characterized as rational. Uh, the purchasers are, until recently, incentivized to have a higher price uh, or for whom price is irrelevant. So that's hardly a rational market. Um, also, I know of one therapy in the last 30 years that has been uniformly effective for everyone. So to say that the marginal cost is incorporated without considering of the efficacy of the treatment uh, seems to overestimate um, the reduction. That is, if uh, the extension of life was uh, infinite cost and now it only costs a million dollars per person, uh, to say that that's a cost reduction when it works for only 10 percent of the population, and even for that percentage of population, we're not sure that that extension is, um, is a cure, uh, seems to exaggerate uh, the reduction in price. Uh, and then so, from... So let, I, I, let, let's, th that's two questions on the table, and I'm, I'm not sure we can even... So it has to do with both... Uh, the share of the population that is actually uh, ben actually benefits from the treatment is is not 100%, um, and that uh, I'm sorry, and, the, and oh, and the comment about the the market. So how does that play out in uh, the analyses that you all have? I don't want to have a discussion of the, about the definition of rational, but the, it's true that basically Part B Medicare and many plans in the private sector has followed this, has in cancer care many times paying people uh, an ASP price, or basically a markup, a cost plus system, where the doctor or clinic, when they acquire a drug, they get paid three or six percent, uh, depend on the legislation, about what the acquiring price is. So what, it, what does a doctor do? Well, he, he likes expensive drugs, because three or six percent is, is of an expensive drug. It's a lot more money for him than from a cheap drug. That's a perverse system, and I think a lot of people have criticized that for decades, uh, that that's a problem, and I think that's well well acknowledged. However, a lot of cancer drugs are not only sold to clinics, they're also sold to hospitals, which are under what's called a DRG system, which most people here know about, but that's a fixed payment for diagnosis, and therefore the hospitals are the cost-conscious one as opposed to uh, the clinics. That's something uh, clearly unique in, in, in injectables. Uh, it's not necessarily true for uh, for most drugs uh, outside of oncology, et cetera, but it, it certainly is a problem. When it comes to uh, uh, <clears throat> when it comes to the effectiveness, now clearly all drugs do not. Uh, we have a lot of treatment response heterogeneity, and hence hence we have the personal medicine movement, which is trying to figure out who's going to respond before you take your treatment. The reason that has occurred in oncology is because taking the treatment and figure out you're a non-responder is most costly in oncology because your tumor could be growing and you could be dying. So I always joke around, we're not going to have personalized medicine in erectile dysfunction because people are not that upset about trying things that don't work. In oncology, in oncology, we're going to have, in oncology, it's very natural that personal medicine has emerged in oncology because that's where learning through experience on being on the treatment is most costly relative to other drug classes. And that's where we see this response to the not 100% of people uh, uh, responding, or uh, people responding differently on treatment. Uh, there was a gentleman here. 
We're, not, we're clearly not going to get through everyone, but let's try to get through who we can. Hi, my name is Kevin Dyer-Rotner from the Heritage Foundation. This question is for Warren Stevens. So your, uh, your talk was interesting, and you, your work suggested that um, the uh, outcomes are better for the higher spending countries in terms of, uh, in terms of cancer care. Um, some uh, health, uh, health policy researchers have suggested in this country, in the United States, which is one of the higher spending countries, to impose price controls on uh, the insurance companies and healthcare spending in general. Would the implication of that, according to your research, mean that the outcomes would become worse over time? Become worse over time? Probably not, uh, because costs are, are, are constantly falling. Um, innovation diffusion and plus the fact that generally prices fall over time suggests that if you're achieving, if you're using the same technology, you're not introducing any new technologies, uh, you'd plateau out in terms of what you'd achieve, but the costs would generally fall. So you'd be getting more value for money, but you wouldn't be making more progress over Sorry. time. Yeah, that was my question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, here. Did I answer that? I'm going to oh, I'm going to try to try to get three in before the break, and we'll do our best. Julie Cantor Weinberg, Business and Health Policy Solutions. You talked about treatments. Do you see any implications in your research for diagnostics? Dr. Phillips, and you mentioned uh, precision medicine and the whole move to match testing, and particularly genomic testing is rising in cost to treatment. So I, I wondered what, your, what you thought. Well, diagnostics as we currently do it is uh, very uh, different from how we uh, uh, incentivize therapeutics. Uh, and the reason is that there's very little value-based pricing in diagnostics, meaning they al almost compete down prices to cost for, the, for lab tests or whatever. And that is one reason, in my opinion, that personalized medicine has not gone faster. We, it's been a lot of promise for a lot of years, but, this, but, but companion diagnostics coupled with treatments are not uh, highly uh, incentivized to, or, or in, in terms of developing it. Because what a diagnostic does is, is provides information, whether it's on treatment response and as a companion diagnostic, or just about the disease, if it's just a regular diagnostic. And then you have to price out that information. How valuable is that information? If you price it right, the innovators have the correct incentive to bring those things to market because more valuable diagnostics uh, receive more R&D dollars. But currently what we have is a system that we don't have value-based pricing for diagnostics, which we do for, for uh, you know, medical pro other medical products, I should say drugs, biologics primarily. And that's a big issue for per the, the, the revolution of personalized medicine because we, need, we want these things value-based uh, in order to in for innovators to want to spend the VCs or whatever to want to spend money on, on diagnostic companies. Sorry, I can't remember who. Someone raised their hand very early, and I can't. I think it was you here, so I'm going to. Uh, quick, quick question, Bonnie McLean. I write in health economics, and we always we talk about costs. We talk about cost all the time, but we don't talk about. Are we talking about how here in the U.S. the drug industry sets the cost? Are we talking about the reimbursement that we give to the providers? Or are we talking about the cost of the care to the patients? It seems like we shift the definition when we're trying to make a particular point. And if you, if you have time to just clarify what is the cost when we're comparing ourselves with the drug industry controlling the reins versus the NHS and people that can negotiate based on those actual outcomes. I will, I'll make one point and then I'll like Warren and respond as well. The issue in oncology care, in my, in my view, is that there's an insurance failure as opposed to a pricing failure. Why are we so upset at oncology pricing? It's because the patients are having these huge co-pays. Patients are revealing they really like these products. How do we know the patients really like these products? They're going bankrupt in order to get them. Very few people go bankrupt for something they don't like. And I understand, I understand. So the issue is that there's an insurance failure. When you are in an e ICU, you are costing far more than the, the cancer patient is costing. No one is an uproar over medical device pricing in the ICU. Why? Because you don't see that cost as a patient. It goes into your premium on average and you, you share it with other people. So it's the fact that we have these high co-pacing cancer that has led to this uproar, in my opinion. 
uh, because there's far more expensive care out there than cancer care. But it's not an uproar when the patient doesn't see the spending unless they see it in their premium when they share it with other people who are healthy. I think that's the real difference. If we had adequate coverage for life-threatening diseases, which is what insurance is about, uh, the, the, the cancer pricing issue would fall on the payer. They would negotiate the prices, which they currently do, and then basically you wouldn't have this uh, public uh, uproar against cancer care. Warren, do you want to? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think one of the big problems, as you say, is this, this constant flitting between price and cost and, and expenditure. And I, I think in, in cancer has got a lot of attention uh, because a big proportion of a lot of the effective interventions are drugs and pharmaceuticals, where the prices are set by uh, the drugs and pharmaceutical companies in, in this particular country or under negotiation with payers, whereas, of course, um, places like the NHS have a lot more bargaining power, but also they can make decisions about whether to improve or, or, or okay a, a, a new drug based on cost. But of course, in cancer, I think, a, a big, as I say, a bigger proportion of the overall cost of treatment goes into, it comes from drugs and pharmaceuticals. And in lots of other areas, uh, as, as Thomas says, there's a lot more sort of inpatient costs and a lot more other costs that, that are not associated with you know, new innovative technologies or, or private companies coming into play. So. Cancer is sometimes seen in, in a slightly different light, but I don't think that it should be. It should be the total cost of treating, whatever the source, whatever the technology, whatever the type of, of utilization, uh, applied against the value. And again, Thomas is, I agree with Thomas, the, the issue of value is just, just not as strongly a component of these decision-making processes in this country. So I, I have to chuckle in response to your question that we've had discussions among the editorial staff at Health Affairs about the appropriate use of the words price and cost because the lay version and the economic uh, it, uh, definitions are not exactly the same. So it's not just politics. It's actually substantively very difficult to figure out what the right word is. John, very quickly. Thank you. John Rother with the National Coalition on Healthcare. Um, another element of the discussion of value is uh, total society resources. And when we have a new generation of cancer drugs, the biologics coming out that are likely to be priced at six figures, some of which will be lifetime therapies, uh, it does raise the question of how to reconcile that with other social demands uh, on budgets. And uh, in an era where we're moving to capitation more and more, uh, it seems like we've set up a collision course uh, between efforts to increase value with limited budgets and unlimited costs of new therapies in cancer. And it's not clear what's sustainable. So uh, maybe that's a question. <laughs> that sounds like a good question for the break, because I'm not sure that there's a, a succinct uh, uh, yes. answer that can be given, except I think everyone would agree with the challenge that it raises. Um, I don't want to completely uh, destroy your opportunity to get a cup of coffee. So uh, let's uh, take a break here, uh, five plus or minus minutes. We'll get back shortly after 1030. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Well, just to... Uh, prove to you that our creativity at Health Affairs knows no bounds. Uh, rather than getting into a cost versus price debate, we have entitled this next session, Paying for Care, therefore avoiding any possible confusion. Uh, you'll be hearing from Ken Mandel, professor at Harvard Medical School and the Boston Children's Hospital's chair in biomedical informatics and population health. Uh, Ken directs the intelligent health laboratory within that chip, which for those of us in another world think of as the Children's Health Insurance Program, but that's not what this is. It's the Children's Hospital Informatics Program. And you will then hear from uh, Stacy Dusitsina, a pharmacoepidemiologist and health services research with a primary focus on using population level data to estimate the costs and use of medications. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in the Division of Pharmaceutical Outcomes and Policy in the Eshelman School of Pharmacy with a joint appointment in the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Gilling School of Global Public Health. Uh, we will begin uh, with Ken. You want to? Oh, sorry, come up here. Sure. Terrific. Click away. Or... Beautiful. I'm not seeing slides. Do you have slides? I do have slides. The slides are not. Coming. There they are. Oh, they're just after. The... They're just after. We'll get All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to start off. Uh, there was a there was a real estate analogy before. I'm going to give you another real estate analogy. Um, 
Some time ago, my parents uh, had a flood in their kitchen, and the water was pouring out of the dishwasher all night, and it went down to the basement below, and everything was kind of wet. And so they were worried, what, what do we need to do? What do we need to do about all this water? So the insurance company actually sent over a contractor, and the contractor took this magic infrared meter and pointed it at the wall. And this was a diagnostic test. And unsurprisingly, it showed that the wall was wet. And given that the wall was wet, he recommended that they undergo major surgery for their house. This house was supposed to tear out the kitchen, the floor below, all the walls and the thing below. And this was to avoid mold, avoid a bad diagnosis later. And my parents resisted the um, aggressive treatment option and went for watchful waiting. And a few days later, the walls were dry. So this was, in a sense, um, an overdiagnosis. Uh, and they avoided the overtreatment from the overdiagnosis. So the, the punchline of this talk could be the way the recommendations are going now, but really it's the starting point when we're talking about breast cancer. So the United States Preventive Services Task Force recommended not screening women aged 40 to 49 um, instead of what had been annual screens from 40 to 75. Instead they said just screen biannually, biannually from 50 to 75. So that was a big change, 2009, in their recommendation. 2014, the Swiss Medical Board actually recommended abandoning screening altogether. And if you look at the Western European nations, um, usually the screening is biannual. At, um, at, uh, in the UK, it's triennial. And um, it generally starts more like 50. So this tells you that across the world, the benefits of screening are clearly being debated, and screening is being dialed back. So if you have a mammogram, just like if you have your walls tested by a contractor, there's a few possible outcomes. The most likely, fortunately, is that it be normal and you go on. Then there's early detection of a treatable tumor, and this is the outcome that we're hoping for with mammography in women who have treatable tumors, and you go on and you get early detection. Then there's the ID of an aggressive advanced tumor, but it's untreatable, so you found it, but the test didn't really help you in the end. You might feel it helped you, but it didn't. Then there's the false positive and the overdiagnosis, and this is the focus of the paper today. False positives are positive results for breast cancer that are subsequently recognized not to be cancer. And this leads to additional diagnostic workup. Some people call it a cascade. And once you're on that cascade, it can go quite far. And then, of course, there is psychological distress. And there is a conflicting literature on how distressful that distress is. Um, but it is, uh, and, and certainly, um, something one would prefer not to be living with a cancer diagnosis for days or weeks waiting, or possible diagnosis, waiting for a false positive to be cleared up. Then there's overdiagnosis. And here is where you actually diagnose lesions that are unlikely to become clinically important during the lifetime of the patient, but you think they're cancer. And this is where you end up getting, um, uh, actually treating women because of the test who would never have been treated and never have needed to been treated. And this is actually turning out to be um, something in the range of 21 to 31 percent of women treated. It's estimated from some uh, from uh, different studies in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, this, the U U.S. and Canada um, are uh, th that there's a 20, 21 to 31 percent overdiagnosis rate. And if you looked at ductal carcinoma in situ, the, the rate of that disease went up 500% when we started screening for it, um, strongly suggestive of an overdiagnosis syndrome. So in the study we did, we defined costs as the total amount paid by the insurer to the healthcare provider 
for a healthcare service. So this is what was actually paid. And we used, we looked at all medical services related to breast cancer in the 12 months following the screen. And specifically, we looked at false positives. So these were tests that were positives, led to diagnostic workup, but didn't result in a cancer diagnosis. Uh, we looked at invasive breast cancers, and those were just invasive breast cancers, all the invasive breast cancers, and we looked at ductal carcinoma in situ and looked at those costs. And then we used the false positive rates and the overdiagnosis rates from the literature and applied them to the costs. And we used 11%, which was a, a number from the literature that was actually precisely confirmed in our data. And uh, we also uh, we used 22%, which was on the low end, uh, of the overdiagnosis rate, and we used a very high rate for the overdiagnosis rate for ductal carcinoma in situ, which is, I believe, um, conventionally accepted. So the, uh, so the bottom line is that the, the, the total costs, and there's a, there's a sensitivity analysis in the paper, but the total costs are $4 billion per year. And if you look at um, what's going on in cancer care uh, in the White House, uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative is about how precisely to treat exactly the right people with exactly the right drug. And this is what um, a colleague of mine, Zach Gohani, calls imprecision medicine. And he was on the original report that defined precision medicine, so he has some right to uh, make fun of the term. But this is imprecision medicine, where we're precisely treating the wrong patients a certain fraction of the time. And there is the opportunity to actually examine how we might be able to improve this. One way to do it is to actually think about personalized screening, which is based on a risk factor um, or a set of risk factors that range from age all the way to um, genetic predisposition. And I think I've got the red card, and I'm ending right here. Thank you. There you go. Oh, we got you. Okay. So thank you everyone for um, the opportunity to present today and for being here. Um, as a couple of people have alluded to, the terminology here can be a little tricky. So I want to start by orienting you to the terms I'll be using um, in this short presentation. This is an example explanation of benefits. Um, if you've received any kind of treatment, you've received an explanation of benefits if you have an insurance company. And I want you to look at box labeled 19, which is the amount billed. Those are also what I'll be referring to as charges. Those are the prices that are assigned to a health service um, by the physician. And then if you look at box 24, uh, the one at the far end of the screen, you'll see that those are the allowed amounts or the reimbursed amounts. And those are the prices paid by your insurance company, for example, as a result of negotiations. So in this hypothetical example, the charges or the billed amount is $156, but the company or the insurance company and the patient together only pay about $44. So we used public use data um, that is available nationally on charges for procedures delivered in outpatient physicians' offices, and we summarized the charged amount, so the billed amount from the previous slide, and then what was reimbursed by Medicare, and we also looked at what was reimbursed by private health insurance for the same um, services. And here I pulled out a select group of chemotherapies that we looked at. So this is per infusion charges. Um, so the red bar is the non-negotiated amount that was paid for the service or the charge. And then the white bar is what private insurance paid, and the black bar is what Medicare paid for those same services. So what you can see here is that for chemotherapy, the charged amounts are about twice as high on average than what is reimbursed by insurance companies. In uh, just one example for bevacizumab, the charges are about $9,200 per infusion, and the reimbursed amounts are around $4,500 for each insurer. We also wanted to look beyond uh, just 
chemotherapy services to see how consistent these findings were regarding the differential, differ, differential between the charges and the reimbursed amounts. And so we looked at outpatient um, services. So this is just a general uh, visit code for looking at new or established patients with different levels of complexity. And we see similar things where the reimbursed amounts for Medicare, for example, are about half as much as the charged amounts. Now, what we contend here in our paper is that the charged amounts are actually the amounts that could be asked of uninsured patients when they go to receive health services. So the contention is, is that these are the amounts on the bill. So if the patient is uncomfortable with negotiating or doesn't think to negotiate or the provider doesn't extend a discount to patients automatically, that this could be the price for an uninsured patient. So just as a quick summary of our findings, um, when we think about what Medicare pays in relation to what an uninsured patient may pay, for example, we see that Medicare reimburses about 39% of charges and that private health insurance reimburses about 56% of charges for the same health services. So if we're thinking about this from the vantage point that charges are the maximum price for an uninsured person, Uninsured patients could be paying between two and 43 times as much for a chemotherapy infusion than Medicare pays for that same infusion. And they pay between two and five times as much than private insurers. I'd like to just acknowledge my co-authors on the project and thank you very much. Ken, if I can just start with you. Um, we had a discussion earlier this morning about uh, communicating with families and patients. So I'm trying to take a very uh, scholarly piece and think about how you describe the implications to a lay audience. Uh, the concept of false positive in and of itself is complicated. We won't, we won't even go there. But even, let's say we get through that. The question is, um, the only way you know something is a false positive is by the, what happens after, where you determine that the original screening result was not something that you would worry about. So it would, it would seem to me, if, at representing the layperson, that some of the cost associated, some of the costs that you ascribe to uh, overdiagnosis is really the cost of confirming the diagnosis or rejecting it, but that that cost is sort of inherent in the process. So that wouldn't seem to be a bad thing. Um, am I right? Um, I think you're partially right, Good. Um, which is probably where you wanted to hit. Yes. So <laughs> give me something to say. So um, the, the, the family perspective is, is key, and the communication of this has been uh, really at the crux of how um, the screening controversy has unfolded. It's not easy to explain false positives and overdiagnoses to patients. And depending on exactly how you phrase it, it may sound quite different. So if you said, you know, you, there is a chance that we're going to have a false positive, we'll get through it, it's going to be stressful, but there's a big benefit at the end versus it turns out that the most likely thing that's going to happen to you is a false positive. The most likely, a very likely thing is an overdiagnosis. And there's actually a very small percentage of cases that could be treated. And so if you did nothing, as in the Canadian study where they randomized women for 25 years and found a lower uh, I found a higher cancer rate in the mammography group, suggesting that cancers that were not cancers were being picked up, that you're actually subjecting yourself to additional risk, then a woman and a family and her family might have a different take. So we, I don't think we've yet um, come to a consensus as a medical community on how to phrase that question or on aspects of this cost uh, decision analysis that are outside of what we studied, which are the, what are the actual benefits. So if you believe the benefits are very, very high, 
then this $4 billion might be um, cost you spend on the way to those benefits. But if you believe that those benefits are marginal, then the $4 billion, which represents um, revenue that's being generated around this um, whole process, uh, you might say that the revenue is driving the process and that the process is not serving um, women in this larger decision uh, framework well. So I think getting physicians to, to agree as a community on what that risk equation looks like and how it should be defined for patients is actually probably a key next step. Great. Thank you. Um, Stacy. you present data that shows sort of the starting point of what happens if someone uh, who's uninsured uh, needs and receives care. Can you talk at all about what we know and what we don't know about what happens from that point forward so that we could uh, put it in sort of a policy context of what we might do about this? We can do something about the number of people without insurance, but your focus is on those, and there will there certainly continue to be tens of millions who don't. What do we need? What do we know? What do we need to know about what happens after uh, that uh, bill is first presented? Sure. Um, I think that there is a lot of missing data on this particular topic because a lot of the things that we're able to study are based on um, studying things that happen to people with insurance. So we don't know a lot on the population level about what happens to people without insurance. Um, and in particular, some of the major gaps that we have are, you know, we don't really understand how much patients ultimately end up paying for the services. So we know that this could be a starting point for the bill, but there's very little evidence about what patients ultimately pay. We also don't know the extent to which patients are facing um, both personal challenges financially, such as bankruptcy. We have some information on this, um, and also that their credits being ruined by being sent to collections, for example. So there are lots of gaps. There have been some good studies to kind of um, get at some of these issues, but um, they're few and far between because we were missing a lot of data on this um, subpopulation of patients. Um, I, I do think that one thing that is promising moving forward is the push towards having more transparency in pricing. Um, and part of this is geared towards helping patients who are insured but on high deductible health plans, for example, to be able to make more informed decisions about uh, choosing a health provider with a lower cost for the treatment that they want, for example. And so I think that this will be a place that helps both insured and uninsured patients if you can actually access information about what is the typical charge for a procedure. Uh, but we still have a long way to go in improving transparency there as well. Um, let's open it up to questions that you all might have. You are brimming with excitement this morning. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going then and hope that I can get someone else uh, thinking. Ken, let, let, since you gave such a robust answer to the first question, I, I have to follow up with a second, which is it seems that a large share of the dollars that you're describing have to do with uh, DCIS. And so that seems to me to have more, almost more of a clinical element to it than some of this risk balancing element to it. Can, can you just go a little deeper? Because that was an important part of the finding. Yes. Um, yeah, the DCIS is, is expensive. Um, uh, the number of cases of DCIS in our data set was not that high. Um, and so the other costs do contribute substantially to the whole. But it's a very interesting um, subgroup of what we're looking at, uh, of the cases we're looking at, in that uh, again, it was uh, barely a disease before screening started. Uh, then screening began, and uh, its incidence went up uh, 500 percent. Uh, it still results in about 20,000 mastectomies per year, often bilateral. And it's not really clear that it is, um, in fact, a disease that needs treatment in the first place. So it, it gives um, a very, I think, um, uh, focused 
uh, spotlight on the problems of screening. I'll just, just step to the side for a second and just point out that there's another interesting, very similar story in South Korea where they began s screening for um, thyroid cancer uh, with inexpensive ultrasound uh, machines in the office as a bolt-on to a national screening program. Um, so there wasn't a lot of forethought. And the, um, the rates of thyroid cancer, almost every case of which was treated, went up hundreds of times um, over uh, the course of a decade. And almost, and, and mortality stayed absolutely flat. And so almost, almost pathognomonic for um, in other words, it's the only diagnosis that would fit. Almost pathognomonic for overdiagnosis, um, this pattern of higher diagnoses but no change in the outcomes or the mortality. So I think we have to be very, very careful, but you're right, the, the DCIS is a particularly interesting and problematic area. So I'm, I'm wondering, one of the reasons that I think it's hard to change the screening guidelines is because for breast cancers, many women feel very passionately that they don't want to be at risk. And everyone has, knows someone who is a survivor. But I'm wondering if some of those survivors never had breast cancer to begin with. And is, is that one of the conclusions that your study suggests might be the case? So I think, I think our study doesn't particularly support that in the kinds of analyses we do. It certainly doesn't refute it. But I believe that is clearly what's happening um, in some cases. Uh, I can just, I'll briefly relate an anecdote, which is worth a thousand facts, right? So my, my mother was diagnosed with DCIS from a biopsy in the early 90s. And um, I went and took her to the Dana Farber, where we had the slides reread, and we came up upon another problem, one that was just written about in JAMA about two weeks ago, which is that pathologists don't agree with each other. And it turned out that from the Beth Israel over to the Dana Farber, the slides were read as DCIS, and you need a bilateral mastectomy to normal. That was a very happy day. But five years later, to the day, she was called by a study, a, a study assistant at the Dana-Farber and asked, how are you doing? And we, what we realized was that was the five-year survival statistic. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty sure she went into the database as a five-year survivor of cancer. Yes, sir. While the uh, sticker shock uh, that appends to many procedures uh, is used to change policy, I think, with respect to uh, uh, mammography, it has been particularly negative in its consequences, uh, in that the argument was made, remember when this, how this all proceeded was that uh, the patient activist movement begins in the late 80s, proceeds through the 90s, the early 90s is when questions about the utility of mammography begin to surface the cost crisis is progressing throughout these decades, and the equation in the minds of those who object to studies like yours is that we are trying to cut costs and we're doing so by reducing mammography, which may be beneficial. Uh, and that leads to a, you know, a, wholly, uh, a whole aversion to the idea of uh, changing the guidelines. In effect, had we said the reasons why the Preventive Task Force and others are recommending changes in the guidelines is because mammography can do more, is likely to do more harm than good, and leave out the money entirely, I think we would have had a, an entirely different dynamic uh, around the debate. Um, but including the money makes potential patients feel as if we are cutting care at their expense. So uh, this, of course, plays out in more recent uh, debates about cost effectiveness. But uh, re can recognizing that yours is a, uh, 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 an analysis of spending, um, I guess to close out this panel, I would ask if either of you have observations about how to integrate or, or whether we shouldn't be integrating the dollar side of this into uh, communications with patients. Um, so I, I personally think that 
people knowing more about the dollars that are being spent on the treatments because patients are being asked to shoulder a larger and larger proportion, whether or not they're uninsured or whether they're on a high deductible health plan or whether their insurance is just cutting back and passing on a little bit more of the cost in co-payments or co-insurance, for example. So I think it is important to have cost um, be something that is known to patients. Um, it is tricky when you're tying them into things like whether the system is willing to pay for a treatment. Um, because I think we have a lot to learn regarding precision medicine and, you know, what treatments are really of high value to what patients. Um, but I do think that providing more transparency and including information about cost and value of treatments is really important. Yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that the point here was, was a very, very good one. And if, yeah, it's important to know the costs perhaps less in the context of a, of a doctor-patient decision. Yeah, no, of course. I think the reason it's important to know the costs is because without a single person, and I do not believe there's a single person in the health system trying to do the wrong thing in this regard, but we have to recognize that with $4 billion of revenue supporting a particular um, mode of operation, that if we're going to change the guidelines, it would be uh, remiss of us not to understand that there's going to be a revenue shift that goes with that and that there may be resistance on that, uh, on that uh, point. Okay. Uh, my thanks to you both. Let's uh, bring up our final uh, panel and turn to the discussion of, of the quality of care. We're going to discuss uh, three papers that have to do with uh, the quality of care. You'll hear from uh, Carrie Gross, Professor of Medicine and Co-Director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program at Yale uh, and Director of the Cancer Outcomes Public Policy and Effectiveness uh, Research Center at Yale, where the overarching theme of his work is the disconnect between evidence generated from clinical research and the needs of older persons with cancer. We'll hear from Jeff Clow, a general internist in health services research at the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Note the smile on his face. Until recently, a medical officer in the policy and programs group at the CMS Innovation Center and a faculty member in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Duke University, a practicing primary care physician. We'll hear from Nines Ponce, a professor in the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health's Department of Health Policy and Management and director of the Center for Global and Immigrant Health. She is the principal in investigator for the California Health Interview Survey, CHIS, which is the largest state health survey in the nation housed at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. Uh, let's begin with with Carrie. Well, thank you. First, I'd like to uh, say I, how much I appreciate the efforts of Health Affairs and the sponsors in organizing today. And it was great for me to have the experience of uh, meeting the other co-authors kind of coming to life, jumping off the pages of the table of contents. It's kind of like going to Disney World and seeing the characters <laughs> walking around. <laughs> I won't say who is goofy and et cetera. <laughs> so as we've been hearing about today, as well as over the past five or six years, it's very clear that the costs of cancer care are skyrocketing. And we're growing very worried about these costs, as well we should, thinking about the societal level burden of these costs. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the more recent numbers here. In 2020, we're expected to spend over $160 billion on cancer care. That's higher than the budget for the full UK uh, National Health Service, just on cancer care in the US. So in this, in this uh, context of these concerns about co cancer costs, our team set out to answer two questions. First was to look at trends in the cost of breast cancer care. We use breast cancer as a case study due to its high burden on society in terms of disease burden as well as costs. Also because breast cancer has been the recipient of more research funds than any other disease. So we expected that would be the condition if there were to be uh, dramatic changes in clinical practice and clinical progress 
breast cancer would be the one to look at. Finally, we looked at women with stage two and stage three cancers specifically, because again, while these big picture 50,000 foot views are helpful, we wanted to look at stage specific changes over time. So the first question we looked at was the change in cost of care between the 1990s and the 2000s. So when you think of costs of health care, it's a very simple formula to keep in mind. Just think about the percent of people who are being treated, how, or you could think of that as aggressiveness of treatment or aggressiveness of care, and dollars per treatment. What's the do, what are the dollars per unit costs? So we compared these two time periods, and we looked at three the three most common modalities of treating breast cancer, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, looking at trends over time. So again, comparing the mid-1990s to the mid-2000s, <clears throat> if you can see on the left side, we looked at the change in the proportion of women who were receiving each of these therapies. So there was a 55% increase in the proportion of women who were receiving chemotherapy. Surgery, there was no change because uh, almost every woman received surgery anyway. Again, this is within the Medicare program. And finally, for radiation therapy, again, we saw a large increase, about a 60% increase in the proportion of women being treated with radiation. But if you look on the right side, when we looked at the dollars per treatment, there is quite a, a different story. Here, we saw a mild increase in the cost of chemotherapy per woman treated. Again, this is from the mid-1990s to the mid-2000s, uh, not including the more recent, more expensive therapies. There was only a modest increase in the cost of chemotherapy, only about 16%. Cost of surgery actually decreased substantially by over half during the time period. Finally, radiation uh, costs increased uh, tremendously. There was a threefold or a, about a 300% increase in the cost of radiation. Now, I mentioned there are two research questions we focused on. First, we looked at costs of care, and as you can see, uh, the, the different components increased. But the net result of this was that if you look at stage two cancers, the cost to the Medicare program increased from about $12,000 to about $17,000. This is a 40 per patient. This is a 40% increase. For women with stage three cancer, the, the cost increased from about eighteen dollars to $32,000. This is nearly an 80% increase. So this only tells part of the story, though. We saw a dramatic increase in costs. But really, context is needed. As Warren Buffett would say, Price is what you pay, but value is what you get. So the second research question that we explored is changes in patient outcome, meaning in this case, survival over time. So we first constructed a non-cancer control group from the early time period and the late time period. So if you compare, uh, it's one line for the 90s patients and one line for the 2000s patients. The take home point from this figure is that there is no difference in survival for the non-cancer patients over time. Which actually, I know today's focus is on cancer, but that was an interesting finding in and of itself. Among people without cancer, no change in survival. We then looked at the women who did have cancer. Now the top well, I guess now it's the middle pair of uh, lines are women who had stage two cancer. And the upper, darker line is the more, recent, the, the more recent cohort. And as you can see, by the time we reached five years, there was a significant improvement in survival for women um, with stage two disease. The adjusted difference in survival was about, it was 68% in the old, it's 72% in the new. So roughly a 4% absolute difference in survival. Now in stage three breast cancer, there was a much larger difference in survival. Here you can see there's roughly, uh, at the five year point, about 40% of women in the old cohort were still alive. Over 50% um, of women in the newer cohort were still alive. We then broke it down looking at different age groups and different stages because we were curious about whether the oldest old women who are over the age of 80 had different levels of cost increase or survival increase. I'll just summarize this very briefly. Across all groups, stage two and stage three, across different eight, the three different age groups within each stage, there was an increase in cost for everybody, but there was also an increase in survival for all patients, even the over 80-year-olds. 
So in summary, I don't want to get the red card. <laughs> I had one of those in soccer when I was in like fourth grade. Uh, there was a large increase in uh, breast cancer treatment costs, uh, about a 40% increase for stage two, 80% increase in cost for stage three. But there was also a substantial increase in survival for Medicare beneficiaries with breast cancer. The relative increase for stage two was smaller, only about 7%, and the relative increase for stage three cancers was substantial, about 35%. This leads us to a, a discussion of value, which I'm looking forward to having with the group later. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you for having me here today as well. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be talking with all of you. Um, so the motivation of our study uh, there's been, as many of you are well aware, there's been tremendous interest in payment and delivery reform in medical oncology. And we've heard a number of different views. Um, in particular, I think you know, many have focused on the opportunities to reduce inpatient hospitalizations through enhancements at the practices, much like the primary care medical home movement. Others have focused on opportunities to find more efficient care in uh, treatments and diagnostics that are directly prescribed by medical oncologists. Um, one of the things that we found is there is just a, a general lack of data out there as to um, how the variation is actually occurring at the practice level. And that was the motivation of our study, was to um, characterize in a contemporaneous time period uh, the amount of variation that's actually occurring. So how we did it, just to briefly summarize our methodology, um, we used a methodology that was somewhat adapted from accountable care organization models where we first attributed eligible Medicare beneficiaries to medical oncology practices based on where they received the plurality of outpatient care. We then looked at three separate categories that were appropriate for medical oncologists. We looked at chemotherapy, which actually includes um, supportive care drugs, uh, all Part B anti-cancer drugs, and uh, the cost of administration. We looked at advanced imaging, and we looked at medical inpatient stays. And we calculated the average payments for all beneficiaries that were attributed to the practices, and we grouped practices into quartiles of increasing intensity. So you, you can see in this graph, there, there are actually um, two different approaches for each of the service categories. In the first approach, we adjusted only for the uh, originating cancer site and the month during the year at which the patient first went to the medical oncologist. In a second analysis, we also controlled for age, sex, race, comorbidities, and Medicaid eligibility. You can see it, it made very little difference. But to briefly summarize, the difference between the 75th percentile practice and the 25th percentile practice per beneficiary was, a, was close to $4,000 in payments for the chemotherapy category, close to $2,000 for the inpatient category, and just over $400 for the advanced imaging category. Um, we also analyzed uh, individual, the contribution of individual agents. We found that actually close to 40% um, of the, the difference between the highest and lowest quartile practices for the chemotherapy category were driven by two drugs. Pegfilgrastim is an immune cell booster that's used in a, a number of regimens. Um, Bevacizumab or Vastin is an anti-cancer drug that's also used in a, a, a number of cancers. Um, and then PET scans drove more than half of the variation for advanced imaging. So these clearly highlighted some potential focal points. Also, because we were, you know, many prior studies on variation have looked at the geographic level, but we were taking this to a smaller level, the, the practice unit. Um, and so we thought it was necessary to um, evaluate the re reliability of these assessments given that there are many variables we obviously can't account for in the claim system. So what we did is we looked at, uh, we, for each practice, we calculated their average payment and quartile of ranking in 2011 and 2012, and this exhibit shows uh, where they rank. So each, each cluster is grouped by category, um, and then along the x-axis, you have the 2011 quartile, and each bar represents the number of practices uh, by, by 2012 quartile compared to 2011. And you can see that many practices remained in the same quartile. It was very unusual for a, a practice to move more than one quartile over the two years. And of course, we wouldn't expect a perfect association because things do change. Providers may come and go. There could be a change in ownership and, and uh, other changes. Um, but generally, the 2011 average payments was very uh, predictive of 2012. 
Conversely, when we looked across the categories, we had somewhat of a surprising finding in that they were um, very poorly associated with each other. In particular, chemotherapy and inpatient use were completely dissociated, suggesting there may be different underlying factors that, that uh, drive, the, um, drive these services. And advanced imaging was only minimally associated with chemotherapy use. So to summarize, we found a significant amount of variation for all three of the categories suggesting that um, many of the opportunities that have been suggested do exist. I think it also lends evidence to the idea that alternative payment models that are broadly targeted um, may have the greatest opportunity and may also reach the greatest number of practices. You know, for inpatient care, which is an outcome in and of itself, I think, um, and again, we're looking at medical inpatient stays, not surgeries, which are often a, a component of the treatment. I think many would agree that if we can drive to the lower number, um, that's great for patients, great for everybody, and this highlights a real opportunity to understand the factors that can result in fewer hospital stays. Um, for chemotherapy and imaging, it's a little bit more complicated because we weren't ever able to actually measure outcomes, and we don't know what the right level would be. Um, however, the financial differences are pretty substantial, not only for the Medicare population, but also for patients, uh, as we've heard. And so I, I think at the very least there's a need to justify the, different, the higher levels of utilization and demonstrate that they are at least correlating with better outcomes. Um, but probably even more importantly, it illustrates the need to do, um, that there are opportunities to better solicit preferences, communicate trade-offs so that we're ensuring care is patient-centered and consistent wherever a patient goes uh, um, to receive care. And certainly al alternative payment models are an exciting opportunity, both because they, they provide the opportunities for providers to see how their performance may stack up against peers. They can bring a, in a peer network um, to help identify differences in patterns or maybe opportunities to affect care. And of, of course, they can provide the financial support um, to engage in the work and, and understanding one's practice and um, moving towards a, a value-based, or a system that delivers high quality at, at the lowest cost. I'm the last speaker, and uh, I don't have slides, but I do have a story. And the story is about how income inequality might affect access to new emerging technologies, particularly diagnostics. I'm pleased to present this study on behalf of my co-authors, Michelle Ko, Su Ying Liang, Joanne Armstrong, Michelle Toscano, Catherine Sean Fro, and Jennifer Haas. And I thank Health Affairs for accepting the article and for this invitation, and especially to be in the company of the speakers that we've heard from today. So let's go back to 2006, 2007. This is when the study took place. Picture this. A new test, gene expression profiling, has recently come into the market with professional societies deeming that it is a good test. It comes into the market about two years before. Uh, and this is a good test to look at risk recurrence for early stage breast cancer, um, specifically um, ER positive, uh, estrogen receptor positive, lymph node negative breast cancers. Um, through an assay of about 21 genes, the test then evaluates this patient's risk of recurrence. If it's, you get a score, if it's a low score, like 0 to 18, then it's possible that chemotherapy, um, in addition to hormonal therapy like tamoxifen, um, may have uh, no added value. And if you have a high risk score, so 30 to 100, that, that chemotherapy then should be including the treatment plan because you're at a higher risk. Um, you can see that having this test then could help patients and their physicians make the difficult decisions about the treatment plan, particularly for chemotherapy because um, all of the associated costs with getting treatment and possible side effects. Um, there's also, of course, um, if it's no, there's no added value, it could be deemed as a wasteful addition for the payers. So now, in the realm of emerging technologies with uncertain benefit, gene expression profiling does seem to have a good benefit. So it is an effective test, um, although, and I put costly, but I'm going to say, although it's pricey, uh, on average, uh, the cost uh, is about $4,000. 
Well, it's known that there are variations in care across the United States. Certainly, the studies um, today have shown that, and other studies from Health Affairs and other journals, um, especially if it is expensive care. Then what are the factors, though, of this geographic differences, um, and what are these factors, possibly social factors, that are associated with who gets good care, who gets this good diagnostic care, and who does not? And I think this is less known and motivated to study. Certainly for an insured population, if insurance is one way of getting the test, and if the benefits are the same across um, um, uh, different health plans, but the same insurer, then you would, then women, all women stand to benefit. But what about then, if the insurer is a covered benefit, then particularly now, what we're seeing in the SCA, would other non-health care related factors then become prominent? Other social factors might become prominent as an allocator. In this study, we raised two questions. First, we asked whether the distribution of income in a place might have a bearing on the use of a job test. Um, we hear about income inequality in the papers all the time recently, and in this case, we used the measure called the Gini Index. Um, it's a range of zero to one, and theoretically, zero is a place that would have perfect equality and one perfect inequality, one person has all. The, the income. And this range then, so the higher it is, the more unequal the place. We characterize three types of places, a low inequality place, a medium inequality place, and a high inequality place. And we did this by partitioning this continuous Gini coefficient by percentiles. So the lower 10th percentile, and then the highest inequality is the upper 20th or the 80th percentile, and then what's in the middle. Um, we did this for other scenarios, the 90th percentile, the 99th percentile for sensitivity analysis, and um, our results were, um, the inference of our results were pretty much the same. Second, our second question was that for each place, so if there is a a difference by, by the place, within each place, might there also be a difference in income, in the household income of the patient? So in unequal places, might there be a difference in the highest income patients versus the lowest income patients and who gets the test? And again, that was asked of low, in low inequality space, in the medium inequality space, and the high inequality space. Our data is from a large commercial health insurer. Um, our study population um, is, uh, consisted of women 35 to 65 years old, so this does not include Medicare. We examine 1847 women living in 179 metropolitan areas in 31 states. And of course, gene expression profiling is our outcome of interest. So the answer for the first question, or um, again, we're back in 2006, 2007, during the early diffusion of this test. Um, we found that high in the title of the paper, hence, that in high income inequality places, that's, those are the places that were associated with higher use of the test. So the more unequal the place, then there was more use of the test compared to um, lower inequality places. And the difference comparing the low inequality places and the high inequality places was significant, about an eight percentage point difference. On average, at this point in time, there was about a 12% use of the test. Delving deeper into the second question, um, is there a difference by the income of the patient? We found that for the most unequal places in income inequality, that one sees a divergence, um, a divergence between women with lower incomes compared to those with higher incomes. So if I had slides, if this is high in higher inequality, lower inequality, and we looked, this is my, this hand is my, my um, 
high income women, low income, that we see this divergence, it would look like this. So a higher divergence once we get to the, the most unequal places. In the least unequal places, they were pretty much stacked similarly, and there, was, there were no statistical differences. So thus, even among insured women, a scenario analogous to expanded coverage under the Affordable Care Act, social factors such as income inequality um, may emerge as being prominent in determining who gets a new innovation and who does not. This is, of course, troubling in the United States since um, income inequality has been worsening over time. Stop. Sorry. Okay. This, is a, this is troubling. <laughs> Thank you all for those presentations. Uh, Carrie, you, you uh, ended by saying you look forward to the conversation about value, so let's uh, start it. Um, uh, in the first presentation this morning, Tom Phillipson sort of presented a framework for value to help us think not just about what we're spending, but what we're getting for it. Um, so my, my sort of too easy to frame but very difficult question to answer is given what you see, which is improvements, but also more spending, how do you think about how should we as a society think about whether that's a sign of good value, uh, better value, not good enough value? How, how do you make that translation? For me, the fact that we had improvements in both costs and outcomes is encouraging. I, I view this as a glass half full, the outcomes part. Obviously, it's good to have more people surviving after a cancer diagnosis, but the trajectory of costs for cancer care is simply not sustainable. I fundamentally disagree with the premise that society and individual patients are willing to pay a great deal for cancer treatments simply because they work, because not all cancer treatments work the same for all people. So what we really need to do is not only to generate more evidence that can help us to communicate with our patients about exactly how much they might benefit from a given treatment, but also what we really need to do is to start the difficult conversation of value. Because at some point, after we take uh, the, separate the wheat from the chaff and, uh, and are able to redesign healthcare to improve, for instance, uh, to decrease the use of unavoidable care, stop people from going to the emergency room, uh, help people uh, uh, access preventive measures. At some point, they will, we were going to reach the state where we have new treatments which offer a small incremental benefit, which carry a high price tag, I would argue we're at this point right now, and at some point we're going to have to say no. It, it, that's the most challenging aspect of the value proposition is not only defining value, which we need to do, we need to really clarify costs, clarify effectiveness, but we really need to uh, have the courage to have this conversation about can we, can we say no to some tra treatments for some patients and how to do that. Um, Jeff, you, uh, your work uh, fits within a body of work around uh, variation. Much of it historically has been around ge geographic variation. And it's, uh, it's enticing when you see those uh, reports of variation to think, we could all be at the cheapest, the highest quality, whatever, we should just that, if we were all like this, think about how much better the world would be. And then as you start unpacking them, you see the complications associated with that. So acknowledging that the descriptive work demonstrating the variation is the starting point of a necessary conversation, which is exactly what you've done. What are the next questions you would want to try to answer so that we can take this very important understanding of variation and move it not just into the higher level uh, sort of bundling uh, payment uh, that direction that you suggested, but also then to, to uh, refine those models to, to improve value in this area. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most important things are to try and elucidate uh, uh, the factors that are, that are driving the variation, some of which, some of which may be um, you know, legitimate patient circumstances, um, or, or differences in a opinion where they're sort of, um, you know, maybe the risk benefit uh, ratios is pretty even. Um, I think, you know, and, and I think it's, it's going to be very different, um, you know, both across categories and even within categories. There are certainly some drugs on that list where, you know, much work is being done and, and has been done. Um, and, um, 
you know, I, I think if, if we were able to, to drill down to the practice level um, and look at specific indications, look at how the drugs are being used and um, sort of uh, understand on a more granular level what these variations are we're seeing. There may be some opportunities where we could just say there's you know, a clear opportunity where there's variation that's providing no value or such a low value that, that basically no one would tolerate it. I think there will be many other areas where it's, it's in that gray zone. Um, and there, there's you know, where we really have to start having these discussions about um, appropriate value, how we share costs with beneficiaries, what, you know, what are sort of the appropriate policies to, to help sort out those, um, those difficult regions. Uh, Nines, your uh, your work is is complex because it's looking at diffusion of use of an innovation, but not at the individual patient level. It's the it's 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 con social, it's the context of the of of where the patients uh, live. Um, I'm curious. You have a uniformly insured population you're looking at, so that sort of that difference goes away. Um, but beyond the equality inequality in the neighborhood, even amongst those who are insured, there's lots of heterogeneity. And I'm, in particular, I'm thinking um, there's not just the cost of the diagnosis, but there's also, as we've been talking about, the cost of treatment. Any uh, reflection on sort of looking at this, uh, the, at, at the topic that you studied, not just at the front end in the technology diffusion of of the uh, detection, but sort of the whole whole cycle of treatment from beginning to end, would we see similar differences or similar different? Would we see comparable differences if we were looking at the entire cycle? Um, so that that's actually something I could talk a little bit about because the, this this is who gets the test, and then the next um, part is well, if if a patient gets the test. Are they told that they had the test? Do they know about it? And did the doctor discuss with them about what the implications are of the test? And so we have a second phase of the study that's ongoing right now. And we're finding um, disparities by income and race ethnicity that, um, so for example, 20% of the women who got the test didn't even know that they had the test, or that it was discussed. So there's clearly interventions in the pathways of, you know, that triggered, yes, you should order this test, but if you order this test, what um, discussions did you have with the patient? Uh, what uh, questions do we have in the room for these authors? Uh, yes, Tom. Yeah, to um, Kara's work, which I thought was very interesting when you looked at within stage improvements in some sense. I was wondering if you looked at, because there's some work that we and others have done is to get to the previous panel, which is how much of uh, overall survival for cancer patients are due to either improvements within stage, which sounds like treatments, versus moving to earlier stages, which sounds like better detection. So previous work has found, and we've found in our work that 20% roughly only of the overall gain comes from moving people to earlier stages, at least in the SEER data, which is the common data that people analyze. And then the 80% comes from conditional on a given stage, you're doing a lot better, which was true in your data. Is that something that you're, uh, you've looked at? That's a great question. So you're referring to what uh, Alvin Feinstein used to call the Oklahoma effect. When the Okies moved to California, the IQs of both regions increased. Same thing when you, are, uh, when you start doing more uh, rigorous imaging of patients with cancer, you'll upstage people, and therefore the outcomes of people within each stage seem to get better. Uh, so that's a really important potential bias of, of any work looking at temporal trends. Uh, in our study, we did not look at the use of uh, intense imaging such as PET scans, which uh, only really didn't start to disseminate into clinical practice until the very end of our study period. CAT scanning was around the, throughout our whole, the whole study period. So we felt it was unlikely there would be a huge difference in staging, approaches to staging during our study period, but it's a really important potential limitation. Hi, John Young from ASCO. This question is for Jeff. Uh, you've talked about APMs and APMs in the context of cancer care. I always, I always thought that 
there's a pathway to get to, say, bundling, if you will, from, say, fee-for-service through capitation, through ACOs, medical homes, and so forth. Can you talk just a bit more about the application of APMs in cancer care and sort of what you think about uh, sort of where we're going with that trend? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And, um, you know, alternative payment models is sort of a, could be as confusing a term as, you know, all the, all the payment terms. And they um, come in a lot of uh, different flavors. You know, I think certainly something like like bundling that's been mentioned is a pretty aggressive alternative payment model. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know that there's anyone out there that's doing a, a full risk payment model given the, the science of how we can, um, you know, measure appropriate care at the oncology practice level. I do, in our study, you know, everybody in the study was under the same payment system. So we can't say that the payment system was the cause of this variation. Part of the reason why um, we've argued that alternative payment models are important is that they provide a number of things. One, they provide uh, data, which is, I think, an important step. You know, most providers would probably have no idea um, where they sit on the map. Um, and, and they, you know, frankly, provide a, a learning network of peers to help kind of understand, um, you know, what you, may be, what you may be doing differently to help identify strategies, particularly for more complex categories like inpatient use. Um, and then, of course, there's the, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just the incentive from the payment, but also the support to do the real work that's involved in, you know, both um, whether it's collecting data, analyzing data, um, testing new strategies to, to change practice patterns. So I, I think um, data like this really helps suggest that the types of alternative payment models, it, it suggests, you know, where the potential opportunities are, um, and it, uh, you know, help, it can be used in a way to kind of um, test those initial strategies. Um, but I think there's a long way to go in determining which will be the ultimate alternative payment models that are, that are implemented nationally for, you know, forever and ever. Take one more question. We do have time. Please. Just uh, Let's get the... Uh, Right. With a comment Anne made about the uh, Emperor of All Maladies, the Ken Burns documentary, um, after looking and watching the whole series, there seemed to be a common voice at the end that with the limited resources we have, you know, really prevention is really where we need to focus a large amount of the money that's going into research nowadays. And it would be, I would like to hear, if you, if you can, you know, comments towards that, you know, as we wrap up the afternoon. It's a great place to great place to close this out. I'll let each of you take a turn at that. It's an interesting concept because certainly we have not made, uh, frankly, we have not made much progress in finding a cure for cancer, and I, I think it's clear that interventions such as tobacco cessation and more recently weight loss would would have a much more substantive impact on decreasing the burden of cancer. But also, as we've heard, uh, prevention in the sense of mammography screening also may be imposing a substantial burden in and of itself. So I think we do need to be uh, focusing uh, more efforts than we are now on prevention, but we also need to be generating data and, and listening to that data uh, with regard to what it's showing us about what's effective and what's not. Sure. Um, you know, as a primary care physician, my general role in the cancer system is actually in prevention. Um, but, you know, and I, I think um, the way I think of it is it's important to think about, you know, where we can get uh, the best bang for our buck, where we can find um, the best investments. And I, you know, it, it, certainly as we've heard, it's not uniform across prevention, it's not uniform across treatment. I think, what, you know, whatever the category we're looking at, we need to think about, um, you know, break down what, whatever the individual um, procedure, decision, or, or technology is. Um, and, and so I don't necessarily even think about it, whether it's prevention or treatment, we should, you know, try to strive to a place where we um, judge everything on an, on an equal level. What I zoomed in and what Anne said uh, was how, did, how do these technologies diffuse in communities? And particularly, I think looking at community health centers and looking at safety net providers would be an important step in terms of prevention, but in also in navigating how to deal with treatments along the way. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to these, these panelists and to all of the earlier ones. Our thanks to Precision Health Economics and Celgene for supporting the issue and the event. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we hope you enjoy reading the issue. <laughs>